O hidden life, vibrant in every atom. O hidden light, shining in every creature. O hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May each who feels himself as one with thee know he is therefore one with every other. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Angel Storra and I am the General Secretary of Spain. Our speakers this morning are two very thoughtful and much respected speakers and we are delighted to be able to listen to them this morning. Our first speaker is Tranti Kim Dio. She is a postgraduate in pharmaceutical technology. She joined the Theosophical Society in 1972 and until recently she was general secretary of the French section. She is chairperson of the European Federation of the Theosophical Society and together with her team she organized the last European Congress held in Paris in 1914, uh, in 2014. The next European Congress organized by the Federation will, be take, will take place in August 2017 in Barcelona, Spain. Kim Diu has been giving monthly courses at Paris headquarters since 1987 and has also worked here at ADR. As part of her responsibilities as chairman of the European Federation, she has been helping to publish theosophical literature in Russia, in Russian, Hungarian, Estonian, Slovenian, and Croatian, and has received, <coughs> sorry, has re revived TS activities in Eastern Europe. She has been guest speaker at summer schools, seminars, and congresses, to the European School of Theosophy, at Crotona Institute, and at the School of the Wisdom here in Adyar. She has made lecture tours of New Zealand, Singapore, the Philippines, Australia, and Canada. She regularly conducts meditation retreats in Europe. Her main concern and focus is to promote an authentic way of living guided by universal ethics and mystic dimensions of consciousness. Her lecture this morning is entitled Responsibility Transforms, Compassion Transcends. Kim Diu. Friends, brothers, here present and all over the world who are watching now over internet, I would like to share with you some of my thinking about the subject of responsibility linked with compassion. Very generally speaking, when we start to think about the two subjects, there is an inner feeling that say that they are very intimately linked. And not far from us, from our studies, an excerpt from the little book at the feet of the master 
reminds us, students, that God has a plan, and that plan is evolution. This reminder is worth to be pondered upon through a lifetime while endeavoring to put into practice one's own understanding. May I make a reminder here that the whole book, small booklet of At the Feet of the Master, is just a summary of one chapter of Viveka Chudamani compiled by the great Shankaracharya. But I'm not going to go into it because I am convinced that there are many serious students who have done it. Now evolution implies change. Change for the better of all. It embraces the one stream of consciousness without distinction, meaning including all kingdoms and all beings. The divine wisdom or theosophy teaches that each of the various kingdoms in nature has its own destiny and role. The divas or angels are meant to comply with the universal law and execute the divine will on the theater of manifestation. The humans have a different destiny. They are meant to understand the same universal law and apply it consciously at their level. This is called the Dharma of each kingdom. The same wisdom explains the difference between angels and humans. While the angels are designated to accomplish God's plan without reasoning, the humans are to use the faculties of reason and intuition to understand and feel the divine will in order to rightly accomplish it. Now coming back to the human kingdom. The notion of responsibility can vary according to the level of development of each individual. In some culture, particularly in China and in India, this responsibility starts with oneself, meaning that one has to be responsible on the individual level, then responsible to serve one's family. And out of serving one's own family, one learns to serve the community, meaning the society of humans, and larger, one has to serve, learn to serve the nation and the earth. Responsibility becomes then universal. It means that not only one is responsible towards oneself, one family, one's family, one's community, one's nation, one's planet, but one has to learn to be responsible towards the whole universe. After all, each one of us is just a child of space, so it is just one part of our responsibility. Now working on oneself to develop understanding about divine, the divine and the divine will, and applying this understanding to serve evolution corresponds to realizing universal responsibility. This part is the fundamental duty of a human being, the first step on his spiritual path. This responsibility calls for transformation, transformation from outside and transformation from inside for the improvement of the world and also for one's own transformation called self-reform leading to one's own spiritual path. Now saying all this, I think that everyone agrees, or not, 
one has the freedom to agree or not to agree, but I think that it sounds, that makes sense, that one starts with responsibility. But something is still unhappily lacking, unhappily lacking, because there is a dawning in consciousness which makes everyone easily feel that there must be more because a duty even fulfilled perfectly is never enough. For example, you cannot say that you fulfill the duty towards your children, your parents, and that's it. There's something behind that makes you fulfilling this duty. Interestingly, at the feet of the Master, after the exhortation for the practices of discernment, desirelessness, and all good conduct, at the feet of the Master, it emphasizes that all qualifications without love would never be sufficient. In a similar way, one can feel that all transformations incurred just by responsibility would not be enough to lead humans to the completion of their dharma. To move beyond the human kingdom, human consciousness needs to be trans transcended, and this transcendence makes a human a god. This transcendence is gained as a consequence of compassion. Now, what is compassion? This is the big question. A big question, at the same time, easy, and then paradoxically difficult. Easy because everyone pretends to know what it is, and difficult because no one can be sure that what one knows is true. What is compassion? Compassion is considered as a consequence of wisdom, prajna, and wisdom is considered as the outcome of the completion of meditation, samadhi. According to Chang Buddhism, this is a branch of Mahayana Buddhism, Mahayana tradition. According to Chang Buddhism, who late, which later on became Zen Buddhism in Japan. So according to this tradition, genuine compassion is a manifestation of true wisdom. Why should I say genuine? Because genuine and true things cannot be named. It is very similar to the Tao described in the Tao Te King. It says, the Tao that can be expressed is not everlasting Tao. The name that can be named is not the everlasting name. So we can paraphrase, paraphrase saying, compassion which can be named is not everlasting and true compassion. What to do if we cannot name things and still we have to think and ponder about it? So forgive me, I am going to use a term, but at the end of my sharing, let's forget that all those words has no meaning if there is no realization of its background. So true compassion cannot be named. Why? Because naming things lead to the risk that this thing turns to be something virtual. In the case of compassion, the risk is that this notion can be turned to be just flat charity. Compassion is not charity. Although compassion cannot be named, and although one can say that due to the fact that it is the foundation of consciousness, karuna, it is the basis of heartfelt thinking, heartfelt speech, and heartfelt action. It manifests itself 
on three levels in the kingdom of humans, mind, words, and acts. One cannot have a compassionate words and keep incorrect thinking and incorrect doing. In the Buddhist tradition, compassion is not only essential, but vital. Essential because it is at the basis of consciousness, is named karuna. It is vital because a true human being cannot possibly live without it. Daring to take a step further, one can say that viewed from the point of substance, viewed from the angle of substance, and since the universal consciousness is identified with akasha, compassion may be seen as the fundamental characteristic of akasha, in which is anchored everyone and everything. One can have the feeling that a strong and intimate link binds together Compassion, karuna, wisdom, prajna, and the fact of seeing things as they are. At this point, how can one avoid mentioning the great Naharjuna, who in the famous Lankavatara Sutra gives an accurate description of consciousness? all kinds of consciousness at all the levels, and describing with fineness and accuracy the phenomenon of perception. The seeing of things as they are is that, is that seeing of the essence of all things in their non-separateness and their vacuity of real existence. This notion of shunyata is at the source of prajna, wisdom, and karuna, compassion. Likewise, one can hear from the Heart Sutra, which is a shortened form of Mahaprajna Paramita, the basis sutra for Mahayana Buddhism. In this very shortened form, the Heart Sutra, one can, one can read the dialogue between the disciple Sariputra and the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. The all-knowing being the universal store of higher knowledge. Sariputra asked how those who wish to serve humanity and free it from ignorance should see things. And Avalokiteshvara answered, all things should be seen as a bubble, as a flash of lightning meaning there is no substance, no reality in everything, even in oneself. Yes, because nothing has a real existence. On this subject of Shunyata, His Holiness, the 14 Dalai Lama, states more than one occasion that shunyata is a principle that negates all contradictions in self-existence. Shunyata only negates but does not affirm. And the Dalai Lama continued to quote another Madhyamika philosopher and I read the quote. The word self denotes 
any self-existent essence or substance in anything whatever that is not dependent on others. Negation of self is shunyata, meaning that the seeing of this interdependence of everything related to everything is the denial of a separate self, and this is shunyata. And he continued in, on another occasion, saying, generally speaking, the knowledge of the ultimate nature of all dharmas, all things, is actually a contradiction of what we think we know. The truth that is the ultimate nature of all elements, of all ob object, is shunyata, meaning nothingness, vacuity. If we go a little bit earlier in history, we can read from Huineng, the sixth patriarch of Chang Buddhism, generally known as Eno in Japanese. He said in the sutra, famous sutra of Huineng, he said, the knowledge of shunyata, the void, is essential to remove ignorance. Once a person had got close to the understanding shunyata completely, he is on the way to wisdom. And wisdom is complete comprehension of shunyata. We come now to the point that nothing exists, really, and we can say everything is non-existent. Not yet, friends, coming backward earlier, we can read from Naharjuna, the famous quote I'm reading, I'm reading to you. All dharmas, meaning all things, are neither self-existent nor non-self existent. Neither both self existent and non-self existent, nor different from both. It is absolutely sublime sublime because you cannot affirm anything. You cannot affirm this and then you deny, you affirm the opposite, no and then neither this nor that is non-existent, and both should be deleted from the view of reality. Naharshana continued saying, when one is definite about the meaning conveyed by this I, meaning the me, when one is definite about the meaning conveyed by this I as being a mere designation separate from the logic of the fourfold categories, which I quoted, then one has grasped the real significance of the non-existence of I. We can see that all the dharmas, all things, cannot be existent since existence means, self-existence means to exist independently compared with all the other things around. Such is for shunyata. Now, what is prajna or wisdom? In the Sutra of Weneng, the sixth patriarch of Chong Buddhism, we can read the realization of prajna, wisdom, is the mind without a single thought. He asked, what is the mind without a single thought? And his answer was given, it is the fact to see things in the mind without being tainted by them, without any clinging on them. And he concluded on this subject in the same sutra, each one has to develop a mind which settles nowhere, 
This is a famous quotation an old Mahayanist uh, would know about this. Coming to this point, one may ask, what can one do? What may one do? Of course, it is legitimate, because coming to this understanding, one observes that something needs to be done. And to answer this legitimate question, what may one do, or what can one do, Taisat Taitaro Suzuki, the one who has retranslated the Chinese, the Lankavatara Sutra from Chinese into Sanskrit. You know, at a certain time, Buddhism was banned from India, and every sutra, every sutra of Buddhism uh, had been burned. And very, very fortunately, some sutra were, were saved by the translations of them into Chinese. And then the huge, uh, immense work of uh, Taitaro uh, Suzuki was to retranslate all this material back into Sanskrit. And in his uh, very deep and brilliant introduction to the Lankavatara Sutra, one can read, I quote, whatever enlightenment one gains, it must be shared by one's fellow beings. And now we end up with this, the refugees to the Buddha, the, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And beyond it, when there is some growing into compassion, it is unavoidable that one takes the vows of Bodhisattva. A Bodhisattva is the one who takes the vow to help humanity and all sentient beings to reach to freedom. Freedom is the liberation from universal suffering. I don't know whether it makes sense to you, but at this stage, at this point, one cannot ask the question, are you sure that we are suffering? The question itself testifies that there is non-seeing of the fact of suffering is universal. You can say, I have a good life, I have good, good friends, good help, good comfort, everything seems to go in a good way to me, but what is suffering? And this is the basic suffering that one does not know that there is suffering. Now I'm not going to go into the whole theory and the explanation of the suffering and why we suffer, etc. You know better than me about this. But the fact that one, since one has seen that there is suffering, there is an absolutely natural movement of oneself to vow, to alleviate, and to lessen the suffering for everyone. And this vow is the vow, is the vow of the Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is the one who promised to help humanity in whatever condition humanity is living in, and trying to get the conditions not better, but in the radical, drastic way, so that the humans being, human beings could see the nature of all things, can see things as they are, to the extent of the sharing person, because one cannot share more than what one have, has, and cannot pretend to share what one does not have. Then, the first thing is to take the three refuges, and the second step is 
to take the vows of the Bodhisattva. Are you interested to know? You have heard the three refuges every year at the prayers of religions. Are you interested to hear a little bit more about this? Okay. And then the first when one sees that life is suffering and that something needs to be done, the first step is to join a kind of spiritual community. It is to take the three refuges. The first one is, I will read the three to you and then the commentary also. I take refuge in the Buddha and hereby promise to all sentient beings I shall practice and dispatch the way and develop a mind without measure. I take refuge in the Dharma and hereby promise to all sentient beings I shall deeply assimilate the teachings and let wisdom grow as widely as space. I take refuge in the Sangha and hereby promise to all sentient beings I shall thoroughly and doubtlessly rely all humankind to this wisdom without fear. And as wisdom is growing, one can go a step further to take the vows of the Bodhisattva. And these are the four great vows. Countless are sentient beings. I take the vow to help all to cross the ocean of existence and suffering. Limitless are suffering. I take the vow to end them all. Innumerable are spiritual methods. I take the vow to study and comprehend them all. Unsurpassable, supreme, is the Buddha's Dharma. I take the vow to realize it completely. So from responsibility from many levels, one has moved to another step, to take responsibility towards human, the humankind. In fact, finally, and to put it in the simplest word, I would say compassion is the divine germ which is enshrined in the human consciousness and which works from within, leading it to its blossoming and in due time to the state of an adeptship, the aspirations of humanity. Such I have heard, such I have understood, such I wish to share with you, all bodhisattvas to come. Thank you, Kim Dio, for your wise words. Our next speaker is Mr. Bhaskar Tendul Tendulkas, the president of the Pune Maharashtra. He has a Bachelor of Sciences and an MA and a degree in law. 
He works in industry as a manager in administration. He's a visiting lecturer to postgraduates in human resources management and project guide to MBA students. He's also a director of an institute for orphans. He's a prominent member of the Theosophical Society in India. He's a national lecturer in the end section at Varanasi and a member of the executive committee of the Indian section also in Varanasi. The title of his talk this morning is Human Responsibility Towards Other Kingdoms. Mr. Bashka Tendulkas. Respected International President Tim Boy and his other co-workers in the International Office, my sisters and brothers. I am thankful to the organizers for having given me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this topic, human responsibility towards other kingdoms. Perhaps in the minds of some people, a question might arise as to why we are so much concerned about our responsibility to other kingdoms when we have so many problems relating to our own kingdom. When I am not able to manage my house, why should I bother about my neighbor's house? Even our first object says about to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity. Mainly, emphasis appears to be on humanity, irrespective of all other distinctions. But then, I think there are many other unstated objects of the Theosophical Society and perhaps they are equally important. Madame Blavatsky in her secret doctrine has proposed certain statements, propositions, and they presuppose that there is one life no matter is a dead matter. whether living or non-living. Even the universal prayer with which we began this session has indicated this great truth. O oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom, Every atom in the universe has that vibratory character, that life. O oh, hidden light embracing, 
O hidden light shining in every creature, that intelligence, light is there in every creature. It's not a monopoly of human beings. Intelligence pervades, embraces everything right from star to atom. All living beings, whether humans, animals, plants, minerals. Their emergence and evolution is guided by that one intelligence. But perhaps at our present stage of evolution, we are not very conscious of these realities. We are more conscious and concerned about something which is strongly felt, experienced by us in this physical world. We all try to understand with our mind, which is of course our great asset, but it has also its own limitations. Mind is divisive as they say. Mind cannot see things holistically. Mind divides and tries to understand. And therefore, at the physical level, where we have focused our consciousness, For us, what is physical, what is material, is all that matters. We are concerned mainly with material things, material comforts, pleasures, success, which we feel will lead to a happy, successful, purposeful life. But this has led to a vision which is self-centered. We look at things in a very narrow perspective. Great scientists from different fields have started now feeling that man has lost his foresight. He cannot foresee and forestall things which are happening, which are his own creations. Man is unable to realize the root cause of the problems he is facing. With his sharp intellect, mind, he is trying to analyze his problems, arriving at solutions, but unfortunately in the process, 
he feels he has solved the problems but soon realizes that many more problems perhaps more serious more complex have arisen in the very process of solution of the problems this is the failure of reaching the roots of the problem and perhaps those roots lies in our inability to understand grasp the existence of one life our inability to understand that we are only a small part of that one universal life our inability to understand that we are not independent we are not separate we have to remove the notion which perhaps the modern science in its early stages of development created that man with his supreme intelligence rather intellect is the most important factor in the scheme of existence the feeling that everything else is subordinate to him everything else to supplement him support him for his benefit for his advantage this is the limitation of our mind when we relate ourselves with another individual we are selfish at individual level when we relate as one group to another we are concerned with our group as against another group same applies at higher levels whether it is community nation or at the level of human kingdom when it comes to human kingdom we think of other kingdoms as something subordinate to us dependent on us or meant for us we deny their independent right to exist we feel that they are there to subserve our purposes and that's how we have dealt with these other kingdoms especially in the modern society we are employing them for our purposes we are treating them as our servants as our slaves and assume the role of a owner this is a sense of arrogance as some of the enlightened scientists have said this human arrogance is coming in the way of our dependence on other kingdoms though we have no doubt evolved to a level much higher than other kingdoms we should not forget that all our evolution is dependent upon the evolution of other kingdoms we have drawn everything from them in the making of what we are today 
even as it stands today it's not difficult to see that we for our existence draw everything from other kingdoms the food we eat comes from plants or animals or minerals the water we drink the air we breathe oxygen where from it comes the essential constituents of our existence we don't realize this we are not conscious about this on the contrary we are responsible or ir irresponsible you can say for spoiling all that we are getting from these kingdoms what about the pollution which we are creating had these kingdoms not been there the oxygen percentage would have considerably depleted it would have been difficult for us to survive our modern lifestyle what is it contributing to we are consuming so much of water potable water for maintaining our lifestyle today everything that we are produce we are producing in our plants and factories manufacturing places we are using these essential resources we are consuming thousands of liters of water for say for example automobiles in the process of manufacturing of automobile units we spend about 1 million liters in manufacturing of just 5 units automobile units and at the same time we are suffering from shortage of potable water in our villages depriving this essential commodity leading it in short supply especially in our villages you can imagine what hardships the people might be suffering where water is distributed by tankers once in a week or even at a lesser frequency and this is just to maintain lifestyle of few of our brethren so are we conscious of these realities which are really the cause of the problems which we are creating we have not yet realized that only few people or few sections of the humanity can enjoy a peaceful happy life at the cost of others other sections of humanity as well as members of other kingdoms 
how are we treating our own members treatment which a man is giving to woman treatment which our poor children and old citizens are receiving the way educated elite treats the illiterate a struggle between haves and have nots relations between rich and poor and he says also gone to the extent of our relationship with other kingdoms for maintaining our lifestyle we have lost all sympathy and concern for those members of the other kingdom whom we are using not lying living entities but like objects of enjoyment and entertainment people are fond of hunting they enjoy killing animals we are using woolen clothes clothing how much suffering to those animals we are causing are we aware when we are using these articles we make use of various organs skin fur bones just for our enjoyment we are using them in circuses we are using them in certain games we even fight them against make them fight against each other these games involve considerable violence and sometimes even the death of the animals and we are just silent spectators enjoying the show do we feel that intelligence and emotions feelings are only the areas reserved for the human beings are we not aware that these human beings and even plants have the feelings and emotions intellectually we know many thing that jagadish chandra bose established that plants have emotions but what is our relationship with the plants with the animals we are using plants for decorating our homes we are cutting them we are spoiling them we are giving them various shapes as per our liking so that they will appear beautiful so much of importance we are giving to the false appearances without realizing or perhaps consciously neglecting the hardships and suffering involved and without realizing the repercussions that such acts of human beings 
are responsible for their effects on settler level. We have to be more sensitive. Firstly, before considering our responsibilities to the animal kingdom, I think we should realize that irresponsible actions which we are committing against these members of the lower kingdoms or sub non-human kingdoms, let us not call it subhuman. And mend our ways, our behavior, our approach to them, our ancient wisdom, I think has taught us a lot. You will find in some of the traditions that Animals were respected. They were worshipped. Even the rivers and the seas, mountains were worshipped like living entities. But what are we doing today? Are we conscious? We are using animals say our milking animals. Do we have any emotional relationship which earlier we used to have with our domesticated animals? We treat them like objects in the laboratory. Great dairies they employ computers to standardize their processes of feeding and milking cows and other animals. But there is no relationship, emotional relationship. We consider them useful as long as they are useful to us, milking cows. When they stop milking, what is their fate? This applies to all other species. We are ruthless in our dealings with many species. That's why United Nations is now worried about how many species are getting out of sight, extinction, because we are using many of them for our experimentation. We are causing atmosphere or surroundings where we are making it difficult for them to survive. So much of oil is going into the seas and oceans, making it difficult for the Leavings who are growing in the water. So we have to take a view not from the utility of these members of other kingdoms alone. We are not really separate, independent. We can exist either with them, but if we go on trying to live separately, then that will be at our own peril. Either we will survive together, even the survival of the earth is at stake, as many scientists are warning us the hole in the ozone layer. All these things caused by man, by his own actions, irresponsible actions. We have not understood yet the nature. 
theosophy has time and again said that we can control nature only if we obey nature we have to understand nature we have to obey the laws of nature and we can best understand the laws of nature by creating a bond with these non human living beings because they have remained to a great extent natural while man has lost his own real nature that's why we are not able even to use our intuition which is in fact our birth right i would say and that we can really use if we become part of the nature we live with the nature we submit ourselves to the nature and all products of nature livings which form part of the nature we must have that feeling of respect reverence for the whole of nature for every being in the nature we have to deliberately perhaps at this stage of evolution develop these things in theosophy we talk about study service meditation in that i think these other kingdoms also have a great position radha ji in her article on art of living and loving has emphasized this point how we can learn from the other beings especially the animals even the unevolved animals reflect the beauty of the nature because they follow the nature if man accepts this reality that he is a product of nature and he has to fall in line with all other creatures so far as our relationship with the nature is concerned then i think our revolution our evolution which has got stuck up at this stage we are unable to develop that mind which is essential for our present stage of humanity we will be able to transcend that and perhaps gain back those latent faculties which we are not able to reach with our present approach to living i think time has ended so i will take leave of all thank you brother bashkar thank you for your words thank you both for your contribution thank you all for making this morning one to cherish and remember thank you <laughs>